What's up YouTube? This is Corey from The Overlook and we go over the books that you may have overlooked. Today we are continuing our Avengers No Surrender story with part 5. I don't want to spoil too much but the Immortal Hulk is coming. Uh, other than that we are going to continue with a couple of different series. Um, on the days that we have Lock and Key I'm thinking about alternating into Swamp Thing as well. At least I'm going to put one Swamp Thing video out this week to see how that does. Uh, we are just going to jump back on schedule, so if anybody was wondering about uh, any shortage of videos, well, uh, we're going to fix that starting today. So, until then, I hope everybody's having a great rest of the day, hope everybody's having a great night, and yeah, let's begin. Somewhere, within the cosmos, inside the Grand Master's Cosmic Game Room, the Challenger watches as the Human Torch grabs a hold of the Fire Pyramid. He watches as the Grandmaster stands closer to examine the pieces of the board. Look at him, the Challenger thinks. Preening, pompous, pathetic, weak. So it goes. The story is older than time. In any game, even the game of games, there is always one who surpasses all other players. One who is the greatest of all time. But all time is a long time. Eventually, he who holds the title grows old and soft and flabby and weak. And then a challenger arises. The challenger approaches the Grandmaster and feels nothing but disdain. It's hard for him to believe that the two of them used to be friends. Look at you, the challenger says with a grunt. The Grandmaster, without looking away from the board, tells his opponent, We may have to consult the rule book, challenger. There has been a development. In Peru, Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, grabs a hold of the pyramid and screams as the pain generated from the alien object radiates throughout his body. Miguel Santos, lightning, beams past the point of the pyramid and stops as soon as he can. He looks back, burdened by the feeling of regret. On the ground, Captain Glory of the Lethal Legion stands in salute. His teammate, Farin, the other, agrees. Hmm, she muses. An unexpected outcome. It seems the point is yours, humans. Point? Simon Williams, Wonder Man, interjects. What are you talking about? Corvus Glaive of the Black Order instructs his beloved Proxima Midnight and Ebony Ma that the round is finished. They must regroup and ensure they do not lose another. Captain Glory gives the Lethal Legion a similar instruction. As they turn to leave, Captain Glory swears that they will not underestimate the Earthers again. Sam Wilson, Falcon, tries to rally his group as well. With the other factions already gone, the Avengers must stay and make sure the people there in Peru are safe. Falcon will reach out and search for others and innocent bystanders, and Wonder Man will do what he can to contain the lava flow. General Maverick, the new Red Hulk, and Lightning land on the ground under the location of the once floating pyramid. Maverick sees the expression on Lightning's face and tries to tell him that no one could have seen this coming. Lightning turns his back on the Hulk and tells him, the Black Order sacrificed one of theirs in Rome the exact same way. I came here to warn everyone, but I... I, I wasn't fast enough. Falcon lands and requests that the Red Hulk back up Wonder Man and attempts to back up Red Hulk's sentiment. But Lightning just asks Falcon, Johnny and Rogue were close, weren't they? I need to head back to Rome. Let her know. Falcon tries to stop Lightning from leaving, but Lightning begins to sprint forward, body already transforming into pure electricity and lifts off in the air. I wasn't asking permission. Within the Midtown Manhattan Lenox Hill Hospital, 
Hank McCoy, Beast, and Nadia Pym, the all-new Wasp, feverishly continue to monitor the unconscious Jarvis. Nadia, expectedly, is not doing well at the sight. The Beast sees her, holding onto Jarvis's hand, and interrupts. Wasp? Nadia? Honey, for Jarvis's sake, as awful as this sounds, we need to deal with the science of the situation right now, not the sentiment. Here are the bioscans I was referring to earlier. There are abnormalities that I can't explain. Nadia grabs a hold of the scans and examines them briefly before explaining that all this is happening because Jarvis has been with the Avengers since the beginning. Jarvis has always been there to make sure they were cared for. He has always been within close contact to make sure that they were nourished and bandaged up, to be their support system at all times. So, Nadia's theory is that Jarvis has been exposed to a number of toxins and radiations over the years. Perhaps something got carried back to the mansion. Even in imperceptible doses, Jarvis couldn't have helped being exposed to it here and there. Perhaps what they are detecting are destructive elements that have accumulated and combined over time. Avengers fever, Beast mumbles, turning back to hug Wasp. Avengers fever, Dr. McCoy. And what happens if his fever doesn't break? In Rome, the small group of remaining Avengers lick their wounds. Rogue, Thor, and Hercules clear out rubble and debris in the surrounding area. Thor checks in with Rogue. Unfortunately, their teammates Quicksilver and Cannonball were both brought low by their foes. Yup, Rogue snaps. Sam didn't listen to me, and Pietro didn't listen to anybody. So, they got shellacked. The whole planet is in jeopardy, and we don't know why. What I do know is we need to stop playing defense against these creeps. Agreed, Thor states. These villains must be stopped. Let us gather our allies and... And what, Thor? Have another board meeting? Put it to a vote? Roberto, Falcon, and me are trying to lead the team and save the world, but it ain't working. This is why I don't fit in with the rest of you Avengers. I'm not a politician or a tactician. I don't know how to be a good soldier. I go with my gut, and my gut says that we need to kick these galactic... At that moment, Roke is interrupted by a massive bolt of lightning that strikes the ground. From the cloud of smoke, Miguel emerges. Rogue, it's my fault. I tried, but he grabbed it before I could. Who? Rogue asks. The torch, Miguel says. He's gone. Back within the Grandmaster's cosmic game room, the Black Dwarf and the Human Torch hover crystallized in stasis. The challenger looks at the two pieces that were removed from the board and begins to chuckle. It's almost funny. You had an opportunity to even the score. And instead, one of the obstacles took the pyramid. You say you're the Grand Master, but the game board itself is a better player than you are. Grandmaster replies, Had I wanted an easy game, old friend, I would have picked an easy terrain. Instead, I chose the one planet that stymied we elders of the universe more often than we care to say. Earth, the Avengers world. The world that tames the phoenix, that bested mad Thanos that altered mighty Galactus's very nature. This is the ultimate contest for the ultimate stakes. It requires the ultimate playing field. And, well, you call yourself the challenger now. 
Don't tell me you are afraid of the challenge. The challenger growls before stomping towards the Grandmaster. Yes, old friend. I am the challenger now. The anger painted across his face becomes easy for the Grandmaster to notice, and he recoils at the challenger's approach. Ah, uh, my apologies. I see I may have crossed a... a I am the challenger, the challenger continues, because you stole my name. The challenger grabs the Grandmaster by the throat and lifts him into the air. The Grandmaster squirms as his feet hang above the floor. Hard to believe we were friends once, the challenger thinks. Members of a very exclusive club. The last survivors of the first sentient races. Inheritors of the power primordial, made deathless through the power eons ago in a universe still young. We were elders, and more, we were brothers. All time is a long time, and time must be filled. We too had chosen to focus our immortality on the same thing, the playing of games. And we was my constant opponent, my brother of the board. My friend. He was my friend. In the past, he smiles at yet another victory. Let's see. Hierophant to the fool's shadow. That's hypercheck and mate. Come, let us have another. Game reset. And this time, Try to keep your mind on it, eh, and we gasped. You're calling yourself Grand Master now. Oh, it's the new fashion. We are what we do, after all. Tanelir goes by the Collector. Ord Zionize is the Gardener. You could be the Gamesman, perhaps. Or the competitor. Yes, I suppose I could. The Grandmaster. And we mutters as he covets over the title. But there could be only one Grandmaster. Only one of them could be the greatest of all. Things began to change between the two of them. The stakes of their games grew higher even higher, until you do understand the stakes of this game, don't you? This last game, the winner is the greatest gamer of all, but the loser, the loser will be instantly barred from this reality until it ends. I know, we can still stop this madness, Gast. Can we? Hierophant to full shadow. That's hypercheck and final mate. Endwi puts the piece onto the board and acquires his rightful title as the Grand Master. The challenger begins to reel back in pain as a cosmic energy surrounds him and begins to pull him into nothingness. No, please, I'm your oldest friend. We're brothers, Endwi. Brothers! My name, brother, is Grand Master. And then the challenger is gone, removed from existence, exiled to the far shore beyond all life and death, at the edge of the mystery, where there is no time, no space, no self, where all you are is not, where each picosecond lasts forever and ever without end. There, he waited, in the dark, in the cold, alone and friendless. He waited for everything to die. And one day, everything did. And he began his journey back. 
In the present day, the Challenger continues to hold the Grandmaster in the air. It took a long time to get here, brother. From the night beyond night, a long time to challenge you to the rematch. Indeed, Grandmaster agrees. This is a new contest, but the stakes are the same as before, as are the penalties for cheating. I think twisting my head off would count as cheating, don't you? Come now, Challenger. This rage, it serves no purpose. The Challenger growls again and throws the Grandmaster to the ground. All right, and we gasped. The head stays on, but only because I'm winning. The Grandmaster attempts to stand back on his feet. For, for, for now, it's time for our next moves. In this round, first pick is yours. Then I choose air. The challenger reaches out and grabs a bright yellow pyramid, the electric air, the thunder without mercy. And I leave you the water that runs in your blood. Not water, challenger. Ice, ice that will bury you. Your black dwarf is off the board and keeping score, remember? You started a player short and now you have five players only. <laughs> oh, my dear, dear friend. You've grown old. I was never a player short. I kept one in reserve. A very special ace in the hole who understands the purpose of rage. Elsewhere, within the ruins at the base of a mountain in Arizona, green sparks illuminate the darkness as Bruce Banner awakens from his death. Help? He calls out. Help me? Lightning's words hit Rogue harder than she ever thought possible. Johnny, he's gone. She knows she is supposed to be a leader. She just has to fight through this. But it feels like her heart is going to explode. She sees everyone staring at her, waiting for her to shatter into a million pieces. But she won't. She tells herself that Johnny deserves better. When Voyager teleports back to Rome, she tells Rogue's team that they are on the clock. Their scans have spotted two more beacons of light, the Black Order and the Lethal Legion will surely be close behind. Hercules and Lightning catch Valerie up on the situation, the previous loss they had just taken across the world in Peru, and she is at a loss of words. She offers Rogue her condolences, but she doesn't know what to say. So don't say anything, Rogue snaps. I'm doing the talking. I don't give a damn about this game being played, who the players are or who's winning. I'm done running defense. All I want is to beat them baddies black and blue till they stop messing with me and mine. Is that clear? Crystal, Voyager confirms as the other three nod in approval. Thor asks where they can find the villains now and Voyager tells them that the beacons have been spotted in New Mexico and the Antarctic, but Sunspot wanted her to bring them back to the base. No, Rogue tells her, I'm going now. I'm in too, Lightning seconds. Hercules also voices his support. We will fight by your side, Rogue. Voyager begins to summon a portal and Rogue tells her team, okay, Avengers, let's live up to the name. Back at the Avengers Auxiliary Headquarters, Tony Ho makes a call to Falcon for an update on what's happening in Peru. As Falcon debriefs her, Sunspot walks in. What? Wait, 
The human torch is dead? Falcon, I, I was in the shower for two minutes. I know, Roberto. Nobody's been able to process it yet. And if what Tony's saying is true, we won't have time to. There are two more of these MacGuffins out there? These beacons? Tony begins to summarize the situation. Yep, one relatively close, Los Alamos, the test site of the first atomic bomb. News reports are talking about some kind of superstorm. Gale force winds, lightning, you name it. The others in the Antarctic. A research station nearby is reporting massive drops in temperature and some extreme ice buildup. Air and water. With all they can do in Peru already done, Falcon orders his team to regroup. With the torch gone, they're down to four Avengers. General Maverick tells Sam to hold that thought. Red Hulk begins to transform back down to his regular size. Although he keeps his crimson shade, the transformation is painful and leaves him weak, needing the assistance of Synapse. Ever, ever since Hydra screwed with my bulk genetic plug-in, the dang hour of powers getting shorter. Plus, I got some heart damage and now a few other things. Synapse asks if he could just stop hulking out. Would you? The general asks back. I'm okay. If I can still lift a gun, as soon as these shooting pains go away. After hearing this, Falcon tells the general that he is benched. He calls Voyager for a ride home, but she tells him that she only has enough energy for one trip, and she's already using it on Rogue. She won't be free for at least another half hour. Falcon then calls Sunspot for backup, and he tells Sam that he has an AIM Quinjet two minutes away. And as far as their manpower shortage, they have something for that too. General Maverick begins to be surrounded by a bright purple energy, and within an instant, he is teleported back to the base, and in his place arrives Sunspot, Jericho Drone, and the Scarlet Witch. Unfortunately, Jericho tells Sam that the ingredients for the body substitution are difficult to find. They may not be able to perform the same trick twice. Hey, I'll take it, Dr. Voodoo. Sam sells him. Six Avengers? Our odds just doubled. Wanda lifts her pointer finger into the air and tells Sam to look a little closer. The odds are better than he thinks. Upon closer inspection, Sam realizes that Janet Van Dyne is with them as well. The original Wondrous Wasp at your service? I'm just sorry it isn't under better circumstances. Jan, I thought you were on pause. I was. Our best guess is that whoever's running this wants a specific number of heroes on the field. Janet catches up with the other Avengers and soon after the Quinjet arrives to take them to another pyramid. However, Wonder Man tells the team that he will meet them at their destination. He will need to make a pit stop first. In Lenox Hill Hospital, within Midtown Manhattan, the Beast and Nadia Pym, the all-new Wasp, continue to monitor Jarvis's condition. The Beast tells the Wasp, Nadia, look, Jarvis is stable right now. Perhaps that's the best we can hope for. Hope for more. How are you holding up, pal? Wonder Man says as he enters the room. Simon! Oh, my stars and garters, I'm glad you're here. The Beast and Wonder Man, together again. Pray tell, what news from the front? Simon, being the bearer of bad news, tells Beast that they were able to claim the pyramid that appeared in Peru, but it turns out they destroy whoever touches them. Unfortunately, they lost Johnny Storm. What? Beast asks. I need to be out there, in the field. Let's go. I said, Hank, stop, Simon tells him. Just stop. I don't have much time before I'm going to have to get out there myself and deal with some other pyramid or some other enemy. 
I came to tell you that we all need you here, the both of you. This isn't just about saving the world, it's about saving the people we love. Simon turns to look at Jarvis before continuing. All this from a concussion? Nadia tells Simon that her and Dr. McCoy believe there may be more to it. Accumulated microenergies, trace alien elements, the sort of toxins he might accidentally have picked up in the gradual doses over his years with the Avengers. But suddenly, Nadia realizes if some of it is radiation, no matter what its frequency, it has the ability to eject electrons, turning atoms into cations with positive charges. Simon cannot find anything else to say, but I'm lost, Wasp. No, you're in exactly the right place. Your power is to transform, yes, into ionic energy that's yours to control. The look on Simon's face causes Beast to speak up. We've talked about this, Simon. Ions at base are nothing more than atoms with missing or added electrons. Atoms short are attracted to atoms with a surplus, like those given off by radiation. And that, my friend, is magnetism. What we're saying is, if you concentrate, you can pull radiation out the air. Not just the air, Nadia adds. Power up, cowboy. What am I supposed to be doing? Simon asks. Something new. It'll be a sensation. Like sun on your face. Like sleet on your skin. Just sense the energy in the air. Like you never have before. The world is full of electromagnetism. Focus, and you should be able to feel it rush over you. Then, find the radiation in Jarvis, pull on it, extract it. It's a bad tooth, it's a splinter, pull it. Simon does what Beast says down to a T, but still, he is unsuccessful. I'm sorry, he tells the two of them. I wish there were we're... Hank, there's nothing there. The radiation, alien or otherwise. Whatever you two think is causing Jarvis's coma, you're headed in the wrong direction. In the Antarctic, Corvus Glaive instructs the others of his team. We must hurry, my Black Order, before others arrive and distract us. The Black Swan, for one, did not believe that such cold could exist on Earth's surface, but Supergiant informs her. The paramoid magnifies elemental power nearby to defend itself. The deep freeze surrounding it can hurt even you, Yabat. As snow and rock begin to lift from the ground and spiral around the area, Proxima Midnight tells her love, Corvus, that they will not yield. Victory will be theirs. Suddenly, Voyager opens a portal in the sky above the Black Order and Rogue's team of Avengers come storming out. Rogue must admit, she isn't much for fancy battle cries or stirring speeches. That's okay. Her fists do the talking just fine. She knows it's not very mature, but she has to say, letting out a bit of rage, giving these monsters a piece of the pain rolling around inside her, feels great. She has been fighting all her life. It's what she does. Sometimes righteous, sometimes selfish. The X-Men, the Brotherhood, the Avengers. Good, bad, and everything in between. Rogue leads the charge and flies towards Corvus and lands a full-powered attack to his stomach, causing him to fly backwards. Proxima Midnight attempts to aid her partner, but Lightning flings a bolt at her feet. Rogue rushes Corvus again and lands a combo of punches on her enemy before he is finally able to counter with his glaive. Elsewhere, Hercules tackles Black Swan out of the air and they both crash to the unforgiving ice below. Black Swan 
jumps to her feet and fires off an optic blast in Hercules' direction while Thor uses her mighty Mjolnir to attack Supergiant. Proxima Midnight, still determined to reach Corvus' side, attempts to quickly dispatch Lightning. However, he proves to be too quick when he easily dodges her attack and leaves an after image in his wake before blasting her directly in the back. Corvus Glaive gains the advantage in his fight and knees Rogue in the face, causing her to recoil back. Wanting to get this done quickly, she pulls off her left glove and barrels forward for another attack. Elsewhere, while Voyager takes out Ebony Ma, Thor aims to assist her fellow god, but at the moment, Proxima is able to hold both her and Hercules back with another one of her barriers. Ro continues to fly forward, fakes a punch, and grabs onto Corvus's face. He begins to scream in pain as his life is drained away. Rogue's skin turns white and her veins glow bright blue and burn with energy she doesn't understand. It's painful, but she keeps fighting through it. She's always fighting. Rogue remembers Johnny kept telling her that she wasn't as bad as she kept saying. Johnny said she made bad choices, but she wasn't a bad person. <laughs> that boy's damn optimism. Drove her crazy, but she loved it. Needed it. Still does. But what would he say if he could see her now? As Corvus gets weaker, Rogue gets stronger. She pulls her hand back from his face, and within an instant, she punches her fist through his chest and out of his back. Still lustful for revenge, Rogue holds up the body of the leader of the Black Order and then slams it to the ground. Proxima Midnight, now enraged, is able to catch up to Lightning, and her spear begins to glow as she prepares to strike down her enemy. Before she is able to land a finishing blow, Thor throws Mjolnir and knocks Proxima off balance. Quickly. Black Swan creates a portal around her ally and tells her that they must retreat or all will be lost. As the two leave, Hercules cheers at their victory. Glory and triumph, my friends. Even in this chill, my blood boils with the thrill of victory. We'll rout these villains and ensure that they face justice for their... Hercules is then stopped mid-sentence by the sight of Rogue. Uh, well done, warrior. As Black Swan and Proxima Midnight teleport away, Supergiant remains on the battlefield in order to flank her opponents. Damned Asgardian witch! I'll take your mind for my own, then I'll make you kill your allies before I... Then, within an instant, Supergiant is cut down by a precise chop from Farine, the other. Supergiant doubles back in pain and the energy contained in her body begins to crackle uncontrollably. Farine holds a single finger in front of her mask. Shh. The prize is close at hand, and this victory belongs to the Lethal Legion. In Arizona, Bruce Banner calls out for someone anyone. Help me. I'm still down here, in the darkness, in the shadows. With him, he won't stop. Don't you understand? No matter what, he won't die. Oh God, what if, what if he can't? My name is Glaw Ree. I am a proud captain of the Cree Armada, benefactors of countless ungrateful lesser civilizations, such as Earth's. The Tacolians were an especially foul people, but fierce warriors. My squadron slain, the last Cree standing on the battlefield, I was abruptly pulled away by a force alien to me. I was not alone. Six others, all strangers, had been gathered by the celestial being known as the Grand Master. He tasked us as pawns in some bizarre competition. 
his lethal legion. If we lost, it would simply return us to certain death. Only by besting another group called the Black Order would we be allowed to live. Strange, world-shaking devices scattered across battlefield earth must be obtained in order to triumph. Two have already been claimed, neither by us. At the moment, a third one stands, free and clear. Its meager defense, a band of Terran apes who call themselves the Avengers. Short work will be made. If they had an ounce of strategy between them, they would retreat. Admittedly, they have some minor tricks held, as we say, in chamber, and anyone capable of dropping those blood brothers rests from me some meager amount of consideration. But they've already resorted to using paltry magic tricks. Captain Glory leads the Lethal Legion's charge against the Avengers in New Mexico, each of the members of his team squaring off against their own opponents. Draw attempts to get past Brother Voodoo's conjured serpents of Dambala as Menticle flings its limbs in defense, guarding itself against the attacking Sunspot. When the opportunity arises, Menticle attacks Sunspot's psyche directly, leaving him incapacitated for a moment. Mental Master lifts a vehicle into the air and flings it in the direction of the Scarlet Witch while the two Blood Brothers attempt to catch the Wasp within their grasps. She eludes their every swing and races to help her fallen ally. Captain Glory sets his sights on Synapse the Inhuman, deciding that she needs to be taken out immediately. Synapse evades each of his energy projectiles, predicting his every move. He quickly understands that he must be dealing with a telepath. Elsewhere, the Metal Master begins to encase the pyramid in iron in order to safely retain the device, stating that he has found a loophole in the Grand Master's game. The Scarlet Witch overhears this and demands to know more. She demands to know what sort of sick game the Grand Master has them playing and what part the Metal Master has in all of this. Back in Antarctica, Rogue stands atop of Corvus Glaze's battered body. Rogue, Voyager begins. Not gonna say I'm sorry. Not after what happened to Johnny. The other Avengers' support for Rogue begins to wane, each of them knowing full well that revenge will never heal the wound Rogue wears. Voyager inches closer to Rogue. Your skin is cracked in your eye. I absorbed Corvus's thoughts and powers. It's what I do, Voyager. His mind is alien, but I'm getting glimpses of what brought Corvus and his cronies here. The Grand Master and the Challenger. The Lethal Legion and the Black Order scoring points with Earth as the arena? It really is a damn game. Voyager stands behind Rogue, unsure of how to console her aching teammate, when Fabreen, the other, speeds by, flying in the direction of the pyramid. It's true, human. We are all pawns in this grand cosmic contest. Nevertheless, our legion shall emerge victorious, no matter what the cost. Lightning races off to stop her, but again, he is too late. Farine stretches out her hand and grabs onto the floating pyramid hovering above the group and screams out in pain. Her body contorts as the massive amounts of energy flow throughout her. Damn it! Lightning yells out at his latest failure. The luminescent number one appears in the sky and in the distance, Proxima Midnight and Black Swan watch on. Proxima Midnight, angry at herself, for the outcome of recent events, states, The Lethal Legion has scored. The Black Order is defeated. My husband may be dead. 
the black swan, turns to her partner and tells her, We are still here, Proxima. We will fight on. With another loss on their shoulders as well, Voyager instructs Rogue's group to stay put. She doesn't have enough energy to teleport them all back at the moment, but if she can just get back to the base for a small breather, she will also have an opportunity to figure out a new plan of attack. When Voyager arrives at the base, Tony Ho and General Maverick immediately notice her exhaustion. Voyager begins to massage her temples, and when that doesn't fix her condition, she attempts to apply pressure onto her eye to relieve the pain radiating within her head. Oof, I'll be okay. I can only travel so far with my powers, or move so many people before I have to recharge. That's all. Tony, being the scientist that she is, tells Voyager that is the perfect name for her. Tony has a number of theories about how teleportation might work herself, basing most of her theories on the work of a man named Arthur Vector. My father? You've read his work? Dad was one of the first scientists to devote his attention to quantum entanglement. Simply put, the theory that every atomic particle has a twin somewhere linked to it by faster than light forces. I was supposed to be waiting in mom's car but even as a kid, I could tell something was about to happen. My parents had no idea I'd snuck into the lab to eavesdrop, or how big a mistake I was about to make. Valerie tells Tony and the general about hearing her mother ask her father for a divorce. At the time, the news caused Valerie to run away from her parents in a desperate plea to reject reality. The young girl barreled forward until she got tangled in a number of wires. It shouldn't have hurt, Valerie tells the two. Instead, it took the pain away. All at once, I felt part of everything, connected to every molecule, every atom on Earth. It was so beautiful, is so beautiful. My father never let his interest in me waver again. I was living proof of his theories. After years refining my abilities, we found I could travel instantly along the lines of quantum entanglement and teleport anywhere on Earth, carrying whomever I please. My parents went on to publish their findings. Through science, they made their contribution to the world. When I discovered others like me, we founded the Avengers, and with them, I knew I could make mine. My parents passed away not long after that. All I had was this team. Maybe that's why I don't miss all those years I was gone as much as you think. No matter how much time has gone by, I'm still part of something. Voyager stares at the giant A imprinted on a nearby vault. I feel rested. Let's get me back out in the field. In New Mexico, Sunspot still struggles to fight off Mentacle's mental assault. Red Triangle, Red Triangle. Mentacle sees and hears this, and she is admittedly impressed by the abnormal response. So she probes deeper. Searching subject to Costa's mind for further data. Red Triangle, post him not a command, purpose, mental defense, implanted by Professor X, Charles Xavier, noted by the Recorder Corps as the foremost human psionic talent, quite average by Regalian standards, mental mapping complete, standing by to begin total erasure. Tactical observation, the human obstacles are about to lose their leader. Co-leader, Falcon yells as he kicks Mentacle aside. What was that about tactical observation? He quickly picks up the fallen sunspot and attempts to get him out of range before Mentacle recovers. Captain Glory 
watches everything from his fight with Synapse and thinks to himself, Menticle was too busy with one foe to monitor the rest. I can't make the same mistake. Once the Flyers found a safe space for his wounded comrade, he'll likely come for me. I need to distract the telepath and get some distance. Synapse, reading his mind, tells Captain Glory that that will never happen. She can see what he's thinking. Good, the captain states. Then I'll drop my defenses and let you see everything. Synapse reels back as Captain Glory shows her the secret they have been holding. They really are just obstacles in this contest. Nothing more. Synapse turns to the Falcon and tells him the stakes are unknown, but the Grandmaster pulled together the Lethal Legion to be his players. His challenger summoned the Black Order to do the same. Grandmaster moved the entire planet to liven up this game board with utter chaos. The two teams are competing for the Pyramoids, and once they're gone, the game is over and the game board will be tossed away into some cosmic trash bin. Falcon flies into the air where everyone can see and instructs his team. Whatever we do, don't let them take one more pyramid out of play. Do you hear me? We have to protect this one at all cost. The Scarlet Witch begins to conjure her magics and confirms her agreement. So noted. The Metal Master is not getting his hands on anything right now. Dust and sand begin to spiral around the Metal Master, blocking his vision from the others. As Jericho Drone looks to Falcon in the skies, he is blindsided by the two Blood Brothers. This scrawny stick's not gonna stop anyone, one says. Come on, human twig, bring the hocus pocus, says the other. Drawl attempts to impale the Scarlet Witch by launching her Crimson Spear in the witch's direction claiming that if they cannot crush these flesh-wrapped whelps, then what good are they? Wanda is less than a second away from sure death when Wonder Man appears and blocks the projectile with his kinetic energy control. Captain Glory watches this as well. They're more bothersome than I'd give them credit for, especially counting the new arrival. But by my count, we still outnumber them by one. Captain Glory points his gaze towards one of the Blood Brothers. One we can certainly afford to lose. He then turns his attention to the recovering Menticle and tells her, This is the perfect time. The Avengers are all occupied. Take the steps we discussed, Menticle. Send him in. Elsewhere, Falcon and Wonder Man attempt to box in Drawl in order to cease her assault. She just laughs at their shared stupidity. Menticle then uses her psionic powers to grab a hold of one of the Blood Brothers and quickly lifts him into the air. The Blood Brother pleads for his teammate to stop. Menticle! Menticle! What are you doing? No. Wait! Stop! Pushing me! Send one of the others! Metal Master! Draw! Anyone! Please! Don't do this to me! I don't want to! Menticle stretches out the Blood Brother's hand in order to force him to grab a hold of the Pyramoid. At the last second, three arrows fly through the air and each of them collide with either the device or the brother. The explosives within the arrowhead detonate and the subsequent explosion separates the two for now. Each of the Avengers turn their heads to the newcomers on the battlefield, and there stands their allies, Red Wolf and Hawkeye. Hey gang, Hawkeye states, breaking the silence. Somebody want to fill old Hawkeye in on what we've missed? Elsewhere, in Arizona, the Jade Giant crawls out from under the rubble. From within, Bruce finally realizes it. Everyone's missed it. It was so obvious, and everyone missed it. The Hand, the Empire, they didn't 
do anything. Not really. They just prodded him. And he came back. Because he always comes back. Please, if you're out there, if you can hear me, please, Lord, let somebody be able to hear me. You have to get away from here. Please. He's coming. He can't be stopped. He can't die. You have to get away. In 1872, on the edge of the Valley of Doom, Red Wolf stands at gunpoint. The man at the other end of the gun smiles as he points his revolver forward. Whoa there, Sheriff Red Wolf. I've still got one bullet in the chamber and it's got your name on it. Take one more step and you'll see. Honest, Injun. Red Wolf does not respond to the man. Instead, he just watches. You cannot take the path until you see it. His mother spoke these words to him when he was a boy. She always had grace and poise, even in the face of ignorance and hate. Her example kept Red Wolf true, especially in times of great strife. She taught him how to look at things and as he looks over the field of battle and assesses his next move, he knows his path today will be hard to find. But the path is there. Currently, in New Mexico, the battle between the Avengers and the Lethal Legion continues. Hawkeye quickly jumps into action and continues to fire off more arrows. Falcon swoops by, telling them, You two are a sight for sore eyes. Hawkeye readies another arrow and tells Falcon, I even dress for the occasion. What's the plan? If those baddies get the glowing pyramid, Earth is kaput. Hawkeye releases the arrow with a sigh, stating, Why am I not surprised? The arrow flies from the bow straight towards the Metal Master, but his powers over metal manipulation provide him the ability to halt the arrow in midair. At first, he finds Hawkeye's attempt at an attack almost laughable, certainly pitiful. That is, until the arrowhead detonates and releases a thick cloud of smoke that both momentarily chokes and blinds his opponent. Wahoo! Hawkeye shouts, Wolf, did you see that? Yes, Red Wolf responds, I'm looking. In the Antarctic, Rogue, Thor, Lightning, and Hercules zip through the brisk tundra air with the incapacitated members of the Black Order in hand. Hercules, with Ebony Ma in one hand, gripping tightly onto Thor's hand with the other, asks, How much farther, my friends? I tire of this icy bleakness. I need a roaring fire and spicy meat to satiate my heroic hunger. Thor tells Hercules that he should just be glad that he doesn't have to walk. Lightning begins to have second thoughts about leaving their position. Perhaps they should have waited for Voyager. She did say that she was going to retrieve them after all. Rogue, who was still filled with rage after the loss of Johnny Storm, tells Miguel that he can stay if he wants, but she's not stopping until they get the payback they deserve. Once Rogue sees the reaction on her teammates' faces, she takes a step back and apologizes. Even after killing Corvus Glaive, she still feels empty. Hercules puts a hand on Rogue's shoulder and tells her, John Storm was one of us. His heart burned bright and inspired us all. You avenged him well. That emptiness is the warrior's curse. The hole inside us that will never be filled. Wanting to be of some use, Lightning tells the team that he will race back to headquarters to find out where Voyager is at, or he'll get Tony to call a Quinjet to pick them up before bolting into the sky, leaving a crater in his wake. I like that boy, Hercules commends. He fires forth as if thrown by Zeus himself. Let's see Mjolnir do that, eh, Thunder God? 
back in Manhattan within Lenox Hill Hospital. Hank McCoy examines his newest finding from behind a microscope. You treacherous little malefactor. I found you. Jarvis's illness. We ruled out radiation and alien energies, Nadia. We did not rule out alien pathogens at a quantum level. And thus, the key word is alien. It's not limited in the ways Terran diseases are, which is why I didn't spot it earlier. Any or all Avengers who recently traveled off-world might be carrying it benignly. Certainly one of you unknowingly infected Jarvis, but it's the way Jarvis's concussion rewired his disease defenses that made him quite vulnerable to its effects. May I have your assistance in helping Jarvis? Beast asked the wasp. Uh, of course, I'll do anything, she says, almost taken aback by the question. Good, Beast replies as he jabs a syringe in her shoulder. We have to concoct a vaccine against something we've never seen before. And in order to do that, I need to see if you're fighting it off. Beast takes the syringe and begins to examine its contents. Triumph! Your bloodstream is indeed battling this super-powered sub-organism as well, meaning that emulating your internal chemistry gives us the best chance for a cure. Nadia, happy with the newfound information, tells Beast, now that they know what to do, they need to hurry, because Jarvis's vitals are plummeting. In New Mexico, Hawkeye and Janet Van Dyne, the original wasp, take on Menticle. The wasp shrinks down and buzzes about, and Hawkeye shoots an arrow at their opponent, but it's easily caught by one of Menticle's tentacles before she states, I was in your mind before you even touched this primitive projectile, human. Such physical attacks are useless against- Suddenly, the wasp grows to her full size and within an instant swings her two fists like a hammer and slams them on the side of Menticle's helmet, shattering it to pieces. Yeah? She asks. How about distractions? Do those work? Hawkeye then fires another arrow and it lands directly in the center of Menticle's chest. Hawkeye then turns his arrows back towards the Metal Master, but this time, Metal Master believes that it is his turn to try at the crude weapon. He snatches the bow out of Hawkeye's hands and grabs the arrows out of midair, and with a simple shift of his stance, he prepares to fire each of them back at Hawkeye. Falcon once again swoops in and kicks the Metal Master square in the back, telling him that he needs to play nice. Bows and arrows are all Hawkeye's got. Elsewhere, Captain Glory prepares to fire a blast of Kree energy down at the weakened sunspot. You're out of practice, boy. Too long behind a desk? Sunspot, still woozy from Menticle's attack, tells him, You know, it's not too late to settle this over champagne. Wonder Man flies in and scoops up Sunspot before the attack and tells him, they don't want to talk, Roberto. Trust me, I tried. But did you try champagne? Red Wolf watches while he muses to himself. It took me a moment to see it. The battle around me is chaotic, but it isn't chaos. It's a pattern, a series of tells. There's a way that animals fight when they face certain death with a frantic, desperate, terrified savagery. I see none of that in play from the Legionnaires. To a one, they're cold, fearless, cunning, not suicidal. All they want is to claim the pure void, and they move toward it without any hesitation, because they know something about it that we don't. In 1872, the man's hand trembles slightly. I mean it, he warns. Walk away or get a bullet in the face. A bead of sweat drops down the side of the man's face and his eyes shift, slowly transforming into ones of desperation 
in even despair. Red Wolf watches. He tells himself, fear and courage both make the heart race. They fuel the fire of our actions, but can make us blind to our own mistakes. But if one can slow their racing heart, take in the world around them and see the truth, the way forward becomes clear. It's just having the will to take it. In the present, Red Wolf tells Hawkeye, Give me covering fire, Clit. You heard, Falcon. If our enemies take the Pyramoid, Earth is one step closer to destruction. So, I'm going to collect it. Hawkeye stops firing his arrow and looks at Red Wolf. What? No! You heard what happened to the torch. You touch it, you'll die. No. If I vanish from this place, I will find my way back. You have my word. You've known me longer than anyone in this time has, Clint. We are brothers. Do you trust me? Damn it, Hawkeye concedes. Okay, I can see your clear run coming up. You ready? Yes, I am ready. Hawkeye pulls an arrow back and tells Red Wolf, when I give the word, break right. Red Wolf rushes forward into the battlefield and is immediately greeted by the two blood brothers. He continues to move forward, vaulting over the brothers and racing towards the pyramid. Falcon flies back past Hawkeye and immediately questions Red Wolf's actions, but Hawkeye tells Sam to trust him. In the past, Red Wolf rushes towards his aggressor and with a powerful strike to the jaw, he knocks the man holding the gun to the ground. The gun falls with a thud and Red Wolf walks over to pick up the weapon. How, how would you know? The man asks, bewildered and rubbing the side of his face. Red Wolf examines the gun and opens the chamber, revealing it was never loaded and says, I looked. His parents taught him how to look, to read the world around him, to read the truth in people. He never forgot. If he dies today, it won't be from this. Red Wolf grabs onto the pyramid and with a burst of blinding yellow energy, he is gone. No! screams Falcon. Damn it! We could have stopped them without... Red Wolf didn't want to take that chance. And he was right, Hawkeye tells him. This way, their pyramid is out of play. When the hell did you get so callous, Barton? First banner, now this? The man was your friend. He's not my friend, Falcon. He's my brother, and he gave me his word. Red Wolf is not dead, and wherever he is now, I'm betting the torch is there too. In the Grandmaster's cosmic game room, the challenger grows angry. <sighs> I'm starting to think your obstacles are more trouble than they're worth. The Grandmaster turns to his old friend and then turns to approach the last purple pyramid. Oh, I wouldn't worry. As the Avengers will soon learn, this game cannot end in a draw. Mm, careful, Gast, or I may decide to forfeit your game. Then I'll die a winner. Look at how my lethal legion has fared next to your black order. The advantage is clearly mine, and thus, I will claim the final pyramid, the decider, the quintessence, and I know just where to put it. The pyramid of the soul, of magic and spirit, where better for it than among the dead and dying within the hospital? The wasp cheers as she reads Jarvis's updated vital diagnostic. Much to her surprise, both his heart 
and brain waves are getting stronger. Suddenly, the pyramid appears in the room just outside their door. Countless souls begin to swirl about, haunting and horrifying the surrounding medical staff and patients. The beast sees this and tries to inform the wasp, but out of nowhere, Jarvis awakens and sits straight up. It's a lie, he tells them. It's a lie. It's all a lie. Then, just as quickly as he woke up, Jarvis seizes and passes back out in his bed. Within the game room, the challenger watches. And such a location will summon your obstacles and force. They may even try to claim it. An amusing strategy. But I have strategies of my own, and we remember a peace held in reserve. And I have something else too. I have my hate for you, Grandmaster. I have vengeance. I have my rage. The challenger walks away from the Grandmaster, and the Grandmaster cannot help but be curious as to his next action. What are you doing? He whispers with an eyebrow raised, reaching out with my mind, setting a direction, making an offer. Do you know what rage is, Grandmaster? Not the pain of betrayal, the hurt of being wronged by a friend. Pain is loud, you see. Hurt roars and bellows. It only wants to be left alone, to heal, or to die. But rage, rage is silent. Rage is cold. Rage cannot be stopped. And it never, ever dies.